I think it's important that I start with um, these points, which isn't really the talk, but getting your eye pressure down is the way to control glaucoma. And the evidence for that is just far greater than anything else I'm going to talk about tonight. So don't forget this and never forget your eye drops. They do need to be used, um, whether it's once a day, twice a day, or three times a day, every day. Make sure you're getting them in your eyes correctly. And I know as we get older and stiffer, this can be quite an issue. There are various tricks to getting eye drops in your eyes. Quite a good trick is getting your wife to put them in. Um, but you've got to have some way so that the drops actually get in your eyes. Um, talking to your um, doctor about punctual occlusion is also a useful thing to do. It's really important that you have regular checks with the person looking after your glaucoma because there's just no way you know whether it's been cared for well or whether it's gone off the rails. And this is the big thing about glaucoma, the sneak thief of sight, they call it. The third point I want to make is that there are types of glaucoma we call secondary glaucoma, which are due to something else, but the vast majority of glaucoma is primary glaucoma. And we think that this is really caused by our genes that we inherited from our parents. Not one gene, but a whole lot of genes. And there's not an awful lot you can do about that. But is there more? Diet and lifestyle choices may alter the pressure in your eyes, which I've just stressed is what we're working on. They may alter blood flow to the optic nerve, which we think is very important. And we'd love to be able to control this better. And they may alter apoptosis. Now, apoptosis is how glaucoma marches on. And I think the best analogy I've heard is that if you imagine a row of soldiers standing on a parade and one of them faints, then immediately 10 or 15 around that one will faint also. And this is what happens to our optic nerve. If we damage one nerve fiber, then this process of apoptosis sets in and a whole lot of other nerve fibers give up the ghost and sympathy. Now, the whole problem with this topic is that most of the evidence is soft. And one study says this, and then someone comes along and does a much better organized big study and it says the opposite. And this makes it very difficult to tease all this information out. And there are, there are a lot of studies out there too. I think as a healthcare professional, it's really important that when I give advice, there's evidence behind it. And the trouble is a lot of these studies sort of suggest that maybe this could be helpful. However, some of the things I'm going to say tonight do have fairly strong evidence behind them. And so if you see this red star, that means that I think that this piece of advice is much more evidence-based than perhaps some of the other stuff. Now, there's a number of things that we do in our daily life that can make our eye pressure go up. And I think you need to be aware of these. Playing wind instruments for a prolonged period of time, you know, blowing into a trumpet or a tuba, that certainly makes your eye pressure go higher. And I guess if you've got glaucoma that's not been controlled and is progressing and you spend a lot of time playing a wind instrument, you might have to make a choice. For most of us, however, that's not actually an issue. Coffee, though, is for most people. And coffee makes your eye pressure go up. Um, we generally sort of come to the answer that if you like coffee, why not stick to two cups a day? But be aware that if you drink an awful lot of coffee, it really can have an adverse effect on your glaucoma. Again, yoga is not something frightfully relevant for me, but um, there are many people that really value their yoga. And yoga is, um, involves all sorts of different positions and maneuvers. A number of these, however, involve prolonged um, periods when your head is below your heart. Like I think downward dog is one. I, I think that's stretching my yoga knowledge. The whole point is that if your head is below your heart, 
the pressure builds up in all the blood vessels there and it also pushes the eye pressure up. Standing on your head for a long period of time is not good for glaucoma. Tight neckties uh, is less of an issue these days. Lifting weights, again, there are some people who really value their weight lifting, whether they're competitive or they just like going to the gym and lifting weights. And this pushes your eye pressure up. If you've got mild glaucoma and it's well controlled, I wouldn't be too worried about this. But if your glaucoma is progressing and your doctor's sort of getting a bit worried about it, I really would think twice about spending a lot of time lifting weights. The last one is actually a pretty easy thing to avoid if you know about it. If you drink a lot of fluid over a short period of time, you know, a litre over 15 minutes or even half a litre, um, this will push your eye pressure up for a period. Don't do it. Swimming goggles, again, not something I know much about personally, but this is quite significant. And again, some people spend a lot of time swimming, which is generally very good for you. The point is that goggles with small eyepieces um, can push the eye pressure up quite significantly. And apparently, if the inside measurement across each eyepiece is 52 millimeters or less, this becomes an issue. Um, the best goggles apparently are full face goggles where the two eyes are in the same chamber. Sleep is also quite important. Again, thinking about the relationship of your head and your heart, if we're lying flat, the head and heart are pretty much at the same level, whereas normally when we walk around, your head's somewhat above your heart. There's evidence that um, people who sleep on one side and have um, remorselessly progressive glaucoma will often have the side they sleep on as the one that's going bad. And if you sleep on your face, that makes the eye pressure go up even higher. And again, for most of us, it's probably not relevant. But if you have bad glaucoma that's getting worse despite low eye pressure, one thing that's relatively easy to do is to put some blocks under the head of your bed so you're on a little bit of a slope. Exercise lowers eye pressure. And there's a, quite a lot of evidence about this. The more you exercise, the more the pressure drops. They um, persuaded some glaucoma patients who weren't exercisers to go out on an exercise program and their mean pressure dropped 4.6 millimeters, which is huge. You know, that's a lot. And what's more, this persisted for several weeks after they stopped exercising. And so, um, you know, there's been studies where they look at whole populations and people who exercise have less problem with glaucoma. However, the study that also shows that this exercise benefit is canceled if you have a cup of coffee before you exercise. I have a lot of patients who uh, have the idea that what they eat must be pretty relevant to their glaucoma and they want advice about this. This advice is soft. However, there is some evidence that a lot of omega-3 fatty acids may be helpful. Eating leafy vegetables, eating fruits and vegetables high in vitamins and in the colors, the yellow colors. What I find rather pleasing is that recommending exercise and recommending this sort of diet is the sort of thing we do to say to avoid heart disease, to avoid strokes. So there are many other reasons why you should be following this sort of diet and getting some exercise, preventing dementia. Um, and it also helps glaucoma. So it's nice that there's no conflict here. This is just to sort of try and show you how the studies don't always add up. BMI is basically how overweight you are. If you have a high BMI, in other words, you're overweight, you tend to have a higher pressure. But in another study, those with higher BMIs had less glaucoma. So that doesn't really add up. Mm. So I'm sort of changing tack a bit now, and I'm talking about nutritional supplements. And again, 
a lot of people really want to try something. And in the past, we've been pretty skeptical about this. I guess one of the main points that we stress is that people can spend an awful lot of money um, to no avail. Um, however, um, there was a very good major review published quite recently um, that looked at 33 different trials and found that a number of, that there is some evidence uh, for a number of nutritional supplements. So for a long time, number one has been ginkgo. Um, and there are all sorts of reasons why ginkgo is recommended. And I know some international glaucoma experts who are very um, enthusiastic about ginkgo. Ginkgo comes from the beautiful ginkgo tree, which you'll see um, certainly around the streets of Auckland and the North uh, puts on that show. Um, so you can get ginkgo tablets from um, various health food stores. And then you'll ask me, well, what dose should I have? And I can give you no answer for that. However, there's usually some advice on the bottle. Porcelain is from an Indian plant. That's a, it's a traditional herbal medicine. Um, one of the reasons why this sort of makes sense to us is that we know that it does things biochemically in the body that logically could be helpful with glaucoma. It is also, there's a long experience in using these. And the other thing is that um, there's no evidence that it's a harm, that there's risk in taking it other than to your pocket. PEA is another um, long uh, used uh, uh, supplement. Um, and it's meant to be anti-inflammatory, which may be relevant for glaucoma. And it's long been used for chronic pain and for inflammation. Now, for a long time, we used to poo-poo these because people, um, there was a strong pressure to take um, black currant uh, supplements. And when I trained, we were all told it was a load of rubbish. However, there is evidence increasingly that these um, colored pigments found in berries and grapes and black rice and extracts from them um, can actually be beneficial in glaucoma. And in particular, <coughs> if they're showing benefit in visual fields, that, that um, to me is meaningful. Erigeron brevis carpus, this is a traditional Chinese medicine. <coughs> and again, it's been used for a variety of reasons for some time. Excuse me, just. This is more recent, but it's quite exciting. This study is published in um, the journal based in Australia and New Zealand. <coughs> and um, the authors list, if you, anyone, if you know anything about glaucoma, has got some very high profile people like Keith Martin from UK, Martin Poston and uh, Robert Casson. So this is um, a much higher level of study than most of the things I've been citing. <coughs> what they found is that nicotinamide um, was helpful in quite a small study, which means that um, it's much more likely that this is a real finding. There are sort of theoretical reasons why we should take a nicotinamide supplement. And there's some evidence that um, low levels of nicotinamide in the body uh, may be associated with glaucoma. And nicotinamide is intrinsically involved in very important biochemical pathways um, in the generation of energy in cells across throughout the body. body. So nicotinamide, you say, is that vitamin B3? Well, yes and no. Um, usually when people talk about vitamin B3, they're talking about niacin. And nicotinamide is niacin slightly altered, which our body can do. It's the amide of niacin. The point is that high-dose nicotinamide has been shown to be safe in large trials and really virtually no side effects, whereas High-dose niacin um, has um, caused a marked rise of eye pressure in one glaucoma patient, uh, caused macular edema, which is loss of central vision in another. 
and um, really uh, we wouldn't recommend high dose niacin. Now the point I guess I should make here is that normally when um, you're given dietary advice there's a certain level of vitamin B that they recommend you should have. Now these um, this treatment that we're talking about these are high doses much higher than you would normally have just to keep up with your vitamins and that's where safety comes into it because um, taking too much of a number of vitamins uh, is not good for you but nicotinamide has been shown to be safe. So summing everything up there are so many reasons to exercise um, it can be difficult but even getting out for a good walk now and then is a good start. There are also many reasons to lead a healthy life, to avoid heart attacks, to avoid strokes. Um, so eating fruit and vegetables is good. There's increasing evidence that eating these omega-3 fatty acids, um, which you get in oily fish or you can get in tablet form, uh, is good for you. We know that lowering cholesterol is good for us. And I would say keep your weight in a healthy range, even if it's not helping your glaucoma very much. Don't drink more than 200 mils of any fluid in 15 minutes. Sip your drinks. Think about your sleep position if you've got advanced glaucoma that's been difficult to control. It's not an easy fix saying I'm going to sleep on one side when you're used to sleeping on the other. Um, and I think for most of us, this probably isn't so relevant. Um, it's, it's really for those where they're not winning the battle. I think, however, though, most glaucoma patients should think about how much coffee they drink. I didn't talk about blood pressure. Um, it's quite complicated. Um, in brief, uh, you want it not too high, but also not too low. Um, if your blood pressure is overtreated and the pressure drops too low at night, we think that can cause progression of glaucoma. Think very seriously about weightlifting, about playing wind instruments, particularly about head down yoga positions and tight neckties. If you've got early glaucoma and it's well controlled, I wouldn't personally be thinking about nutritional supplements. But if you've got glaucoma with low pressures and you've been on a couple of medications and you're a uh, clinician is worried that the glaucoma is still not quite, you know, under control. That's when I really think you should think about these things. Um, as I said, the best evidence is for ginkgo, but there's quite a lot of evidence for the anthocyanins. There's also, uh, there's been another big study come out of the States at the, uh, supporting the use of nicotinamide also earlier this year. Uh, and you might hear a bit more about pyruvate as the, the, another coming one. Uh, it's very important that we tell you if we're making any money out of any of these products, and I can assure you that sadly I'm not. So in New Zealand, I think the best bet is actually clinicians' opticite because you've got glinko, ginkgo and black currant, so you've got two of these um, uh, these nutritional additives in it. Um, another one is Blackmore's bilberry eye support, so that's just got the anthocyanin in it. Um, there's a lot more out there than is readily accessible. And um, there, you know, I think you can go to the health shops with that list of um, supplements or go online and um, it's amazing what you can get. Nicotinamide is widely available and it's not that expensive. Um, whereas some of these others, you know, you can start spending real money. And um, this was from the chemist warehouse uh, that's their ad. Um, and so um, I think that's a month's supply. Um, so it's one tablet twice a day, uh, $14.50. So that's my talk. So I'm very happy to um, answer any questions if any arise.